Hello. I'm Richard Clay, and I'm the president of the Filson Historical Society. Thank you so much for joining us for today's virtual lecture. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Jana Meyer. Jana Meyer is an associate curator of collections here at the Filson Historical Society. She received a degree in history from the University of Louisville, as well as a master's degree in library and information science from the University of Kentucky. I will now turn the program over to Jana, but I'll rejoin after her presentation to moderate your questions as time permits. Jana. Thanks, Dick, for that introduction. And thank you all for joining me today to learn more about our Women at Work exhibit and the dresses on display there. Um, and when I had uh, planned to give this talk um, several months ago, um, what I envisioned was that you all would be able to go into the exhibit before or after the lecture um, and really get to see the dresses up close. Um, obviously, that's not going to happen today, but um, I'm excited to give you all a bit of a sneak peek um, into the exhibit, and I hope you'll come back when it is open um, to see those in person. Um, I am putting up at the end of the lecture, I'll have a link to the online version of our exhibit, and so you can um, get on that and, and take a look at things there. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you all. Uh, so I want to go ahead and um, give a little introduction into the dressmaking industry, our Women at Work exhibit, um, and then talk about the four local dressmakers whose work is on display. Uh, dressmaking was a very popular career choice for women who were entering the workplace in the 19th century. Um, we're talking about an era before mass-produced clothing, um, when garments are crafted by hand. And so these are very popular business enterprises pursued by women. Um, we're talking about 75% of business women in the 19th, late 19th century are working in dressmaking or millinery, and millinery is designing women's hats. Um, this is a line of work that it's easy for women to kind of move into. Um, sewing is something women, women have been doing for a while, and so it's seen as kind of an acceptable avenue for them to go into work. Um, and it's got ties to the domestic economy and to women's traditional roles. Um, and so we have a lot of women working in the Ohio Valley's apparel industry. You can just kind of get a sense of how many women we're talking about um, from this listing in the city directory of Louisville in 1898. Um, this is just a partial list. And so we can just really see how many women we're talking about. Dressmaking is very creative. Um, it's rewarding work, um, very artistic. And there's also a lot of demand for um, this line of work. So a modiste who's making custom made clothing um, in the latest fashion is very well known, highly valued and sought after by wealthy women. Uh, dressmakers, um, a number of them really had a lot of independence. Um, they were they own their own establishments, their own custom shops, um, and they were entrepreneurs. Um, a lot of them uh, were deeply involved in the business aspects of the work. Um, other ones had talented partners who managed their business affairs. I wanna tell you just a little bit, um, introduce our Women at Work exhibit. Um, the exhibit explores some of the changes that are happening in women's work in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, this is a time when many women are stepping outside of their homes and domestic roles um, and becoming more involved in public life and work. Um, and as I, I was researching with my co-curators um, for this exhibit, it just really became apparent that um, 
the dressmaking industry was an important thing to include in our exhibition. Uh, fortunately, the Filson Museum collection has more than 300 articles of historic clothing um, dating from 1800 to 1980. Um, and many of these pieces originated in the workshops of local makers active in this area. Uh, in our exhibit, we have the work of four dressmakers represented. Um, the time span that we're talking about is a period of 75 years that they were working in Louisville. Um, so you can see Madame Grunder um, opened her business in 1866 and Mary Cummings Udy, um, down at the bottom, closed her shop in 1941. And so I'm going to kind of proceed through the lecture um, in chronological order, um, talking about um, each of these four dressmakers. I'm going to consider each of the dresses that we have on display, um, talk a little bit about the women who wore the dresses um, and the women who fashioned them. I'm also going to be talking um, about the seamstresses um, who would have worked for each of these dressmakers because I think it's important to acknowledge the work that they did on these as well. The first dressmaker I want to introduce you to is Madame Grunder. Um, she is the first of the four who opened her business in Louisville, um, and she was one of the most independent um, of the ones we're going to be talking about. Uh, Madame Grunder was born Christina Johnson in Holland in 1847, um, and her family immigrated to the United States when she was a very young child. Um, she started her business in 1866 when she was only 19 years old and she hung out a tin sign labeled dressmaking above a home on Green Street. Um, this was probably the family home and I have an image of it here for you to look at. Um, her business really started to flourish after she designed a blue silk bridal gown for a neighbor. Um, and the first piece I want to talk about um, that we have on display of hers is uh, this blue suit. Um, it's a wool suit made circa 1895. And um, our records are actually a little bit incomplete um, for this dress. And so I can't really tell you a lot more um, about, about the suit than, than that. Um, but I really like that we're displaying a blue piece um, by Madame Grunder because this is an auspicious color for her. Um, it's what helped her get her start in her business. Uh, the second Gr Madame Grunder piece uh, that I want to show you is this graduation gown uh, made around 1908. Um, it was worn by a young woman made, named Bessie Terrell Meyer. Um, and you can actually see a picture of her wearing the dress um, on the slide here. Um, there's a bit of a story behind this dress um, that I want to share with you. Uh, so dressmakers often had talented partners who helped them run their businesses. Uh, Madame Grunder had a, a business manager and friend named Emma Maxson, um, who really helped her build a thriving mail order trade. And so Maxson would visit um, towns around the country. Um, she would fit customers with linings for their dresses. Um, and then they kept those linings on file um, for future orders. Um, and so Maxson helped Madame Grunder build a following um, in a number of different states um, and actually several, several foreign countries as well. Um, then in 1887, uh, Maxon tells Madame Grunder that she's planning to get married. Uh, she wants to marry a man named John Meyer. And Madame Grunder is not a fan of this idea. She actually really tries to um, convince uh, Maxon not to get married. Um, she hasn't had a great marriage herself. Um, however, she's not successful. And so she ends up relenting and she sews Maxon a very elaborate wedding dress, which we actually have in the collection 
here at the Filson as well, um, not on display in this exhibit. Uh, Maxon goes on to have two daughters, and uh, these daughters also end up being the beneficiaries of Madame Grunder's design skills um, because she ends up creating graduation gowns for both of the girls. And so this gown was worn by Bessie Meyer um, to her graduation from Louisville Girls High School. Uh, another part of Madame Grunder's story that I want to be sure to share with you all um, is uh, in the bottom corner of the slide here, you can see her petition to become a femme soul. Um, and this is evidence of her independence as a businesswoman. So uh, when Madame Grunder began her work in 1866, she was still a single woman. Um, she got married in 1873 and continued to work, um, but her legal rights had changed dramatically. Uh, when she married, she came under the law of coverture, um, in which her husband represented or covered her political and legal interests. Um, and this is how it was if you were a married woman um, in 19th century America. Um, your husband really controlled everything. Um, and so even though Madame Grunder was the family's primary wage earner, um, under the law, her husband controlled her business and income. Um, I don't think actually he was very good at the job either. Um, he, uh, by the accounts I've read, he was a salesman who wasn't very good at his job. And so, you know, maybe didn't make the best decisions with the family's finances. Uh, so in 1887, um, after 15 years of marriage, uh, Madame Grunder had had enough uh, she submitted a petition um, in Louisville's Chancery Court to become Femme Sole, um, and this would give her control over her business. And so she's petitioning to regain the legal rights of a single woman, um, which includes the ability to own property, trade in her own name, and control her income. Um, and her, her business manager, Emma Maxson, um, is one of the two witnesses who testifies to her business capabilities um, and her testimony helps Madame Grunder win the case. I just wanted to show you very quickly um, Madame Grunder's home at 1236 Cherokee Road. Um, she uh, buys this property in 1904 um, and she lives at this address until 1920. Um, that's the year that she passes away. Um, and throughout all of these years, um, up until her death in 1920, she continues to own and operate her dressmaking shop. The next dressmaker I want to introduce you to is Madame Glover. Um, and Madame Glover is from a large Irish immigrant family. Um, and actually a high proportion of dressmakers um, were Irish immigrants. Um, and Madame Glover becomes one of Louisville's leading dressmakers. Uh, the picture I have of her here is actually her passport picture, um, which is not very clear, but I really like this picture, um, just that you know, she dressed up like this to take a passport picture. Uh, we have two dresses uh, made by Madame Glover on display, and they were both donated to the Filson in 1978. Um, and they actually were both worn by the same woman, a woman named Elizabeth Nelson Helm. Uh, the pink dress was made circa 1900, and in our records, it's described as a shell pink dress with high lace collar and sleeves, matching shell pink jacket with a wide ribbon edge and passementary work. Um, the dress is also described as a trousseau dress, um, and that it, a trousseau is a collection of personal items, including clothing, um, that a young woman accumulated in anticipation of her marriage. Um, and so um, Elizabeth Helm 
uh, got married in 1900, so maybe, you know, this was a dress that she might have worn on her honeymoon um, or very soon after her marriage. Uh, the red dress was made circa 1904, um, and it's described in our records as red wool jacket and dress with red velvet and black cord trim on both. Um, an interesting uh, thing about this dress is that uh, the waist on the dress was so tiny that we had difficulty uh, fitting it on the dress form for display. Uh, just to tell you briefly a little bit about Elizabeth Helm, um, she actually lived in Old Louisville, probably not too far from the Filson over on 4th Street. Um, and she was known as an active club woman. Um, and you can read more about club women in our Women at Work exhibit um, when and we talk about how women are really becoming a lot more active in clubs in the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, and so Elizabeth Helm was a president of the Women's Club of Louisville, um, and she was a member for much of her lifetime. Uh, she was involved in a number of other clubs in the city, and uh, she was also a member of the Filson. Kind of makes you wonder if she might have worn any of the, either of these dresses to one of the old Filson functions. Oh, actually, you know, I want to go back to the picture of Glover here for just a minute. Uh, to tell you a little bit about Madame Glover, um, she was born Anna Casey in Ireland in 1861, um, and her family immigrated to Louisville when she was a very young child, and she began working in the seamstress trade as a teenager. Um, in 1883, um, she started working for the firm Sharp and Middleton um, and soon became head of their dressmaking department. Um, and she worked at Sharp and Middleton for three years. Uh, the store was located on 4th Street in downtown Louisville, um, which was a popular shopping district. Um, in 1886, uh, she got married to a man named Walter Glover, um, and she wore a stylish dress that testified to her taste and skill. Um, her husband was soon known as one of the best dressed men in the city. Uh, and uh, Mr. Glover actually ended up uh, managing uh, the business affairs for Madame Glover's dressmaking shop. Um, and this was a an arrangement that really suited Madame Glover well, because she could focus on her design work um, while her husband handled the business side of, the, of her work. Uh, Madame Glover specialized in creating uh, dresses for debutantes um, and wedding dresses for Louisville's brides. Um, and so she had a lot of young women coming into her Fourth Street shop um, to order reception dresses and ball gowns. Um, some of these young women required as many as 12 to 18 dresses for a season. Um, and the local newspaper um, reported that all of de the debutantes of the early 1900s were gowned in Madame Glover's exclusive shop. Uh, Madame Glover did design dresses for some older women as well. Um, one of her customers was a 46-year-old named Elizabeth Tyler, um, whose diary is in the collection here at the Filson. And I'm actually going to go back to the picture of the dresses here. Uh, so in 1909, Tyler visited Madame Glover's shop and she ordered a handsome ball gown colored pink green. Uh, the gown was ready a little more than one week later, just in time for Tyler's party. And she absolutely loved the dress. Um, she wrote in her diary, my gown was a wonder. I have never had such a stunning one before. Glover is fine. Keeping up with current fashions was an important aspect of Madame Glover's work. Uh, so she went on many trips to Paris, uh, the fashion capital, 
um, and then you know, other countries in Europe as well. She made more than 100 trips to Europe over the course of her career. Um, and she's actually credited with introducing Louisville to one of Paris's latest fashions. Um, in 1910, she introduced Louisville to a slim tight skirt called the hobble skirt. I want to show you a picture of her home at 1510 South Third Street, just a couple blocks from the Pilsen. Uh, she lived here from 1897 to 1912. Um, her husband died in 1912, and so that's when Madame Glover decided to close up her shop. So she closed her shop and sold this home and moved to New York. Uh, the third dressmaker that I want to talk to you about is Madame Mulvaney. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a picture of her. Um, Madame Mulvaney did not run her own dressmaking establishment, um, but was instead an employee of department stores in Louisville. Um, and this is a shift that we're starting to see. Um, more dressmakers start working in department stores as the 19th century draws to a close. Uh, we have one dress by Madame Mulvaney on display. This is a lavender and cream dress decorated with purple and lavender pansies. Um, it was made for a woman named Lily Jefferson Holloway, um, and it was donated to the Filson by Lily's daughter in 1970. Uh, this dress is described in our records as a trousseau dress and a morning or tea gown. Um, it would have been worn soon after Lily Jefferson's marriage, um, perhaps on her honeymoon. And she got married to a man named uh, John Holloway in 1885. Um, I think it's very appropriate that uh, Lily Jefferson wore kind of the fanciest, most elaborate dress that we have on display, the one that has a long train, um, because as I was researching her, um, I discovered that she was a socialite who loved parties. Um, and I was reading these articles in the newspaper about uh, the social events that she hosted or attended. Um, I'll just share one of them with you. She threw a very large party in January of 1883. Um, and uh, in the newspaper, it said, the gathering was one of the largest of the season. The entertainments brought all the ingenuity of the modiste into requisition to furnish something to wear to them. And the result was an infinite variety, dazzling to behold and impossible to describe. Uh, so Madame Mulvaney uh, was actually a bit of a mystery woman. Um, she was described as a Parisian woman in a newspaper article. Um, so I knew that she probably immigrated from France. Uh, she appeared in Louisville in the early 1880s and just kind of vanished in the 1890s. Um, and so I didn't know much about her life other than those couple of years that she was here. Um, but working on this exhibit, uh, really helped uncover more information about her. Um, I, a couple of months ago, I wrote an article for the Filson News Magazine, um, and in that I discussed some of Madame Mulvaney's work. Um, and then I was contacted by an art historian in Dublin, Ireland, um, who happened to be researching John Mulvaney, um, Madame Mulvaney's husband, um, and John Mulvaney was a well-known artist of the era. Um, I've got a picture of one of his famous paintings up on the slide here. Um, and so I was actually very astonished um, to find out that Madame Mulvaney was married. Um, that was not something I expected. Um, she was very clearly living on her own while she was in Louisville. Um, and it seems that she was married to John Mulvaney um, for only a brief time. Um, they got married in 1877 and divorced in 1885. 
Um, and I think she just continued to work under the name Madame Mulvani um, because she'd already established herself under that name um, in the industry and didn't want to, to change it. Uh, so Madame Mulvani was a dressmaker in Cincinnati in the 1870s before she moved to Louisville. Um, and then she ended up working in two of Louisville's department stores in the 1880s and 90s. Um, and as I had kind of alluded to, um, department stores were a way in which the dressmaking industry was really beginning to change in the late 1800s. Um, by the 1890s, department stores are prevalent in thousands of American cities. Um, they're much larger than traditional shops. Um, they offer an unprecedented quantity of goods, um, including ready-to-wear clothing. Um, customers really like them because uh, they have lower prices, um, and then there's the convenience of one-stop shopping. Uh, department stores um, employ many dressmakers and seamstresses, um, but they're also th kind of threatening the livelihood of these smaller custom shops, you know, the ones that uh, Madame Grunder and Madame Glover are running. Uh, the new stores are divided into specialized departments, um, including dressmaking. Um, and Madame Mulvani ends up heading the dressmaking departments at Sharp and Middleton, um, and then JCC Shoals and Company. Um, these are both located on 4th Street in downtown Louisville, um, which is a popular shopping area. Uh, one interesting thing that I discovered as I was um, doing this research is that um, Madame Mulvani and Madame Glover were actually co-workers for a little bit. Um, they both worked together at Sharp and Middleton in 1883. Uh, Madame Mulvani was known in Louisville as an accomplished and attractive French lady with expertise creating Parisian style dresses. Um, one of the local newspapers said of her, in the originality of her designs, in their individual beauty and charm, she cannot be surpassed. Uh, J.C. Seashoals and Company um, even opens uh, a shoe department where they have um, made to order lady shoes that match Madame Mulvani's creations. Um, and you can see the advertisement uh, for that here on the slide. Uh, so Madame Mulvani um, manages the dressmaking department. And so she's probably um, earning a lot of money. Um, she probably has a lot of authority um, running that department. Um, she's also a buyer for both of her employers, um, which means that she's traveling annually to Europe to purchase the latest styles. Um, however, uh, not all of her uh, uh, purchases were um, entirely legal, apparently. Um, in 1891, she and several other dressmakers are caught smuggling dress goods into the United States. Uh, the authority sees seven trunks of goods with the contents valued at $15,000. I'm actually kind of curious about this story, like what happened with it, you know, what repercussions. Um, I'm curious how her employer reacted to the scandal. I don't really know much more about it. Um, Madame Bolvani continues working at JCC Shoals. Um, for another five years um, until 1896. Um, and then she, uh, it appears that she moves to New York um, after that date. Uh, the final dressmaker whose work I want to talk about is Mary Cummings Udy. Um, Udy worked in the early 20th century. Um, so she's the most modern of the dressmakers that we're considering. Um, and she's, Working in a time when dressmaking shops are in decline, uh, most women are buying ready-made garments um, from department stores while she's in business. Uh, we have one dress on display made by Mary Cummings Udy. Um, this is an ecru lace dress. Um, it was 
probably worn by a woman named Annetta Jackman Lowe, um, and then another woman named Mona Hall Fenley um, probably assisted in its donation to the Filson. Um, I'm gonna talk about both of them, and uh, I don't have pictures of them, unfortunately. Uh, the dress itself was probably made in the late 1920s or 30s um, when uh, Mona was a designer um, for Mary Cummings Incorporated. Um, Annetta Jackman Lowe, the woman who probably wore this dress, um, grew up in Louisville and Shelbyville. Um, and then her family actually moved to Miami when she was a young adult. Um, and she kept living in Miami um, following her marriage in 1915. Um, it seems very probable that she was the woman who wore this dress. Um, she liked to dress well. Um, in 1932, she came to the Kentucky Derby um, and her outfit is reported upon by the Courier Journal. Um, and so even though she lived out of town, she had connections to Louisville. And actually an interesting thing about uh, Mary Cummings UD is that all of her clientele lived out of town. Um, and so I do think it's likely that um, she is the woman who wore the dress. Uh, Mona Hall Fenley, uh, the woman who assisted in the donation of the dress to the Filson, um, was an art student in Louisville in the 1920s um, and then became a dress designer for UD. Uh, she worked for UD for about a decade, um, from the late 20s through the 1930s, um, and she was UD's only designer um, because UD liked to just employ one designer at a time. Um, and so I do think that the sketch um, for the dress um, and the dress itself um, were probably, they, they were both donated to the Filson um, by, by Mona Hall Fenley, or she assisted with the donation. Um, and I do think it's one of her designs, and that's why she was interested um, in donating to the Filson. Let's see. Uh, so Mary Cummings UD um, becomes an entrepreneur um, after she gets divorced in 1907. Um, she starts designing embroidery for blouses. Um, and then in 1914, she founds Mary Cummings Incorporated, her dressmaking business. Um, and competition for customers is very fierce during the 27 years that she runs her business. Um, as I said, most women are purchasing the cheaper mass produced clothing um, from department stores. And so UD is uh, kind of focuses on marketing her personalized service, tailored fit um, and exclusive brand. Um, and she really has to set herself apart from the dresses that are available in the department stores. Um, and so her dresses become known for their intricate, intricate embroidery and specialty fabrics. Uh, the building at the top left um, is, at 1401 South 3rd Street um, is UD's personal residence um, from the 1920s through the early 30s. Um, and UD had a very short trip to work um, while she lived in this home. Um, her specialty clothing business was located in a three-story building just around the corner at 222 West Magnolia. And you can see an image of her workshop um, on the screen as well. Uh, the first floor of Yudi's workshop um, was filled with fabric. Um, she was known for importing fine fabric uh, she went um, to East Asian countries, the Mediterranean, Europe. Uh, she also collected samples of handmade embroidery um, that she brought back to inspire her dressmakers. Uh, she had as many as 400 employees, uh, primarily local women, uh, but most of them actually did not work um, in her workshop. Uh, a lot of them worked from home doing hand embroidery, 
um, while others were sales representatives and bidders. Um, and so UD actually focused on serving a national clientele. Um, all of her clients lived out of town, um, primarily in New York um, or other large cities. And she didn't want local customers because she thought uh, there would be too much confusion and distraction. Um, and so each spring and fall, she would update uh, the watercolor sketches in her book of designs um, and send them to sales representatives in other cities. Um, and, and this would, the Spanish beauty sketch here, that would have been one of the designs that was sent out um, for clients to view. Uh, um, going back to her work, the picture of her workshop here, um, the upper floor um, was filled with dress forms and that's a type of mannequin used by designers to tailor and fit clothing. Um, each form was labeled with a client's name. Um, and the dresses were all made in this shop um, and then returned to the customer um, with a fitter who, who would make minor alterations. Udi's most famous client was Sarah Delano Roosevelt mother of President FDR. Uh, Mrs. Roosevelt ordered several dresses, scarves, and bags from Udi in 1937 and 1938. Um, you can see one of the order forms here um, on this slide. Um, in 1937, Mrs. Roosevelt bought a dress called Her Royal Highness um, to wear to her son's inauguration. Um, you can see a fabric swatch of that from that dress here. Um, reportedly um, at the inauguration, uh, Mrs. Roosevelt posed for a New York Times photograph with her arm extended so that she could show off the fine embroidery work on the sleeve of the dress. Uh, another interesting story, Mrs. Roosevelt apparently expected that uh, Udi would give her a discount on her dresses since she was a public figure. Um, and Udi refused to do that. Um, she was concerned that it would result in a reduction of wages for her seamstresses. Um, and so Mrs. Roosevelt ended up paying the full price um, and continued to order from her. Uh, Udi successfully navigated the Great Depression, um, but ended up having to close her business in 1941. Uh, World War II forced her out of business um, because the fabrics that she needed could no longer be imported from Europe and Japan. Uh, I wanna take a little time to also talk about seamstresses um, because I want to uh, make sure to acknowledge that these dresses are the results of the efforts of many workers um, and not just the four dressmakers who I've talked about so far. Dressmakers employed large numbers of young women to sew garments for their middle class and wealthy clientele. Seamstresses had no design input but assisted with basic sewing tasks and were relied upon to maximize efficiency and output. Uh, they were often referred to as sewing girls um, because they were young women and uh, they often would work from sun up until sundown um, and their working conditions um, were often very poor. Um, the fortunate among them were able to sew at home um, but others worked in basements um, cellars and spaces where the atmosphere was described as sickening and stifling. Uh, the number of women who were working as seamstresses in the 19th century is difficult to estimate, um, but there were, there were really a lot of them. Uh, Cincinnati's newspaper reported 4,000 needlewomen in the city in 1853. Um, in 18 74, there were an estimated 5,000 sewing girls in Louisville. Um, seamstresses worked for all of the dressmakers um, who I've talked about today. 
uh, just to give you kind of some numbers on that, uh, Madam Grunder employed 75 to 80 girls sewing regularly um, and 100 during the busy season. Uh, Madam Glover had more than 70 girls who were assisting with basic sewing tasks. Um, and then some of them uh, specialized in, in things like lace or tailoring. Uh, Madam Mulvani supervised many seamstresses um, at JCC Scholes and Company. Um, and uh, during the busy Christmas season one year, um, she kept the girls at work until 12 o'clock every night um, so that she could keep up with the orders. Um, and then finally, Mary Cummings UD, as I mentioned, had as many as 400 employees. Um, and a lot of those were working um, at home doing hand embroidery. Uh, I wanna take some time to talk about um, spe some specific women um, who were working as seamstresses. Uh, Georgetta and Ella Manser were seamstresses in Cincinnati in the 1880s. Um, there's the letter in the um, upper right corner um, talks about their work. Uh, they did not work for um, any of the dressmakers in this exhibit, um, but I do think that um, some of their experiences are kind of representative of um, those of other young women. Uh, and so this is a letter written by Georgetta and Ella's mother um, in 1885. Um, Georgetta and Ella um, were fortunate because they were able to sew at home, um, but they're working very long hours um, just, to make, just to meet basic needs. Uh, their mother writes, um, in part, the girls have to work very steadily from early morn till night, have no time for recreation, but their labor enables them to meet all the expenses. I do not think you can have any idea how much sewing they do. Uh, Georgetta and Ella likely received minimal pay for their work. Um, and you know, the, the large number of women who are working in the trade really meant that uh, compensation rates were kept, stayed pretty low. Um, it was also could be hard to find consistent work because there were busier seasons um, than others and there was a lot of competition for work. Um, if you'd like to view this letter more fully, um, you can do so in our digital exhibit. Uh, the other woman who I'd like to talk a little bit about um, was a woman named Wilma Alban, um, and she worked for Mary Cummings UD um, in the 1930s. Uh, she was actually one of the seamstresses who worked on commissions for Mrs. Roosevelt, um, and you can see um, there, actually, on the back of her business card, um, she's written, I made a black satin gown for Mrs. Sarah Delano Roosevelt in the late 1930s. Um, and so I wanted to uh, consider, you know, what was it like um, for her working as a seamstress for UD? Um, and UD actually seems to have been a very good employer. Um, she provided employees with free psychological counseling and on-the-job training. Um, she also let her seamstresses work from home. Um, and so this flexibility is a benefit um, to those who are also raising children or caring for family members. Um, and then her business uh, provides work for many women during the Great Depression um, and enables them to support their families. Uh, I want to go ahead, I've put up um, the link here to our Women at Work digital exhibit. Um, so you guys can go ahead and copy that down if you'd like. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, make a couple final points um, while you do that. Uh, so the women who wore the dresses um, were upper class women. Um, the exception to that is maybe the graduation gown that I showed you. Um, but on the whole, um, the women who wore our dresses uh, were women who had money to spend on fashionable clothing. Um, but their desires create work for many other women um, in what one author has termed a female economy, 
um, where both the demand and the product are created by women. Uh, another point um, I kind of want to make is uh, that dressmakers came from diverse backgrounds. And so I wanted to consider um, how representative are the dressmakers in our exhibit um, of women who are working in the industry. Um, we do have um, several of our dressmakers were immigrants. Um, Grunder and Glover um, were both from immigrant families. Um, Madame Mulvani was from France. Um, and we do see that, uh, you know, a significant number of dressmakers were um, immigrants, especially Irish. And so I think, you know, in that way, um, our exhibit is representative. Um, however, uh, women of color are not represented as well as they should be. Um, enslaved women were often skilled seamstresses. Um, they did a lot of sewing and some of that um, was sewing elaborate clothing for slave owners. Um, and so after the Civil War, um, when they're free, um, many of them leverage those sewing skills um, to earn a living um, and, and achieve economic success. And so I am curious about um, African-American women in Louisville's dressmaking industry, um, because from the city directories, I can tell that there um, were women of color working in the industry in Louisville. Um, unfortunately, we do not have any of their work um, at the Filson currently. Um, and then a uh, final point um, that I want to make is um, that, you know, I feel like this is kind of a forgotten industry. Um, things are, you know, quite different now, um, but so many women worked in this industry um, in the late um, 1900s and early 20th, and, and early, or sorry, in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, and some of them became very wealthy from the work. Um, just to give an example, um, Mary Cummings Udy, Mary Cumming Udy's estate um, was worth more than $650,000 when she died in 1952. Um, and you can even tell from like the places uh, where these women are living, the, the homes that I showed you, um, that they're living in very fashionable upscale neighborhoods of the day. Um, they were very successful business women. Uh, please visit our Women at Work online exhibit. I'm gonna turn, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and turn this back over to Dick to moderate the discussion. Hey everybody, Jana, I'm, I've got one for you. Um, okay. This is a fascinating topic. How did you decide on it? When did you decide on it? And what's the creative process that you went through as far as researching and writing it up? Yeah, um, you know, I, it, it was a process, as you say, um, you know, uh, as we were kind of looking into um, the ways that women are entering the workforce um, in the late 1800s, um, we were seeing that dressmaking um, was a very important industry. Um, and we had in our museum collection, we, we just had a nice, kind of rep representative um, sample of the work that women were doing. And so um, it's, it seemed like something that really needed to be included in the exhibit. Um, and, you know, we looked at a number of dresses, you know, some of the reasons that we chose to display these particular ones was actually uh, the condition of the dresses. Um, we, you know, had to look at which ones um, were stable enough to be displayed. Um, and then, you know, we wanted to represent uh, a number of women um, who had done work. Um, and so we were able to represent four different dressmakers whose work we have in the museum collection. When was the sewing machine invented? And was most of the sewing on the early dresses that you've shown done by hand or by sewing machine? 
Ah, that's a good question. Um, so the sewing machine, I think, I don't know if the exact invention date, but I think it really started to be used in the 1850s. Um, and so, you know, a lot of the work that seamstresses are doing, they are using machines. Um, these dresses, you know, I'm not, I don't, I don't want to like, I don't know for sure. Um, our museum curators could probably um, speak to that more than I can as far as if machines were used on these dresses at all. Um, but, you know, I think some of the more detail work um, that was done on them was probably um, hand done. Um, like Yudi's dresses in particular were known for kind of the intricate embroidery um, that would have been done by hand. Um, hold on just a minute. I'm going through the list here. Yeah. <laughs> How many times a day did a woman back in those days change clothes? Well, you know, um, the upper class women who wore these dresses, it seems like multiple times a day, yeah. Um, because, you know, one of the dresses was described as a morning or tea gown. And so, you know, it would have been worn at a specific time of, of day for an espe a specific occasion. And then, you know, you had your ball gowns and reception dresses that would have been worn, you know, in the evening to parties and things. So, um, yeah, several times, I think. Um, did designers and dressmakers in Louisville make a dress only for one lady? Or, you know, what if someone else wanted that same dress or something close to it? Yeah, um, that's an interesting question. Um, these, you know, the kind of custom made dresses that um, Grunder and Glover and Udi are making, um, you know, these are tailored to a specific individual. Um, and so, you know, each one is going to be a little bit unique in that way. Um, you know, but obviously, you know, with UD, there were specific types of designs that could be chosen um, because she had that book of designs that she sent out. And so I think, you know, there were kind of specific patterns that people could could pick. Um, but, you know, so they were customized, but, you know, there were kind of certain ones that could be selected. What number of hours do you believe would be involved in creating one of these party gowns? Oof. Well, um, you know, I guess I can estimate that a little bit from um, the, the diary entry that we had where Elizabeth Tyler talked about ordering a ball gown. Um, and so that took a week. Um, and so I think, you know, that might have involved the effort, efforts of multiple women um, working on that dress um, to get it ready. But obviously the turnaround time was um, not that long, really. Pretty impressive. How would a woman like Sarah Delano Roosevelt from uh, the Hudson River Valley in, in New York State, how would she have found Louisville, Kentucky, and, and why was she buying from Louisville as opposed to something in Manhattan? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, UD really did market herself nationally. Um, a lot of these dressmakers too, you know, gained work by word of mouth. And so, you know, maybe um, UD, uh, some of her other clients were really impressed by her work and then just kind of word of mouth, um, you know, uh, Mrs. Roosevelt heard about her in that way. Um, that's, that's one possibility at least, so. I just really want to thank you, Jana, for an absolutely um, fascinating presentation. And you're going to love all the nice comments that people have written um, in the chat room about it. And um, the many thanks to members of the Filson's collection staff for answering um, some of the questions that are more generic in nature um, that went through, and you'll see those as well. Um, excellent, excellent job. 
And folks, thank you again for uh, tuning in. Uh, we're really, really appreciative of your interest uh, in Jana's presentation and in the Filson Historical Society.